My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth of Garforth Education and October Awareness Month is all about bringing an awareness to exceptionalities uh, such as attention deficit hyperactive disorder, autism, learning disabilities, dyslexia, Down syndrome, and mental health awareness. Throughout this month I've been going live to help bring awareness to the public and today I am talking with Dr. Linda Siegel and we are going to be talking about ways to move our school systems from the wait to fail model that's typically seen in classrooms where children have to fail or they have the opportunity to struggle with reading and it harms their self-esteem and they fall behind their peers and we want to move away from that model and towards a model of prevention. And there's this one quote that I love of Dr. Siegel's that says, if I had just one wish in the field of special education, I wish that we would institute a systematic way to find children at risk for reading and or math difficulties and start with targeted instruction in kindergarten. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So I'd like to say hello to Dr. Siegel. How are you? Oh, hello everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't you give us a little bit of a background on why you have this passion and what has brought you to the belief that we can do this? Well, for many years, I've been working with parents and children. And I've seen over and over again, the problems with self-esteem that develop when children are experiencing difficulties in school and nobody really pays any attention to it or tries to help them. Uh, and I have started to do work, done work with kindergarten children and find that it's very easy to detect who is at risk for reading problems and to intervene and to prevent uh, about 98% of the difficulties. Right, and so how do you do that? Well, there's very simple screening that you do. Uh, the um, Basically, we test the child's phonological awareness skills. So that's the ability to hear sounds in words. And we check their recognition or their ability to name the letters of the alphabet. Very simple screening can be done in about 10 minutes. Um, teachers can easily be trained to do it. And uh, the idea is not to identify children with dyslexia because they haven't learned to read and it would be silly to say that they have dyslexia, but they're at risk for dyslexia. So what we do is we do this screening and actually teachers can learn to do it very quickly uh, in about a, an hour and a half workshop, um, which is what I did in North Vancouver. And then for the children who seem to be struggling with these skills, we, they're in a regular classroom, but the teachers pay special attention to them and make sure that they're, um, they're hearing the sounds and words, they're doing the activities. And basically it's a very simple system and it works. Right, so they can do, things with their entire class to help support the development of these skills and then do small group breakout sessions with a group of students that struggle in the same areas to do that targeted instruction and intervention in those areas. Right. Yeah, and you were saying that it's only like a 10 minute screen. So realistically, if a teacher has, you know, 20 kids in her class, it still works out to less than 1% of their teaching time for the entire academic year with these students. So they're able to get that much information that's gonna help inform their instruction and let them know what students need focus on and how to help them get to, so that they're prepared to learn for read when the reading instruction starts. 
And the instruction that we do is whole class instruction. And it's good for all children, not just the children at risk. The advantage of identifying the children at risk is that teachers can pay special attention and make sure that they are grasping the concepts. And it may take them longer to grasp them, but um, it's still, they can uh, monitor the, the skills and to do something about it. But what we found in North Vancouver, that it helps all children. And it especially helps the children who are at risk for dyslexia, but it also helps the children who have English as a second language or English as an additional language. It really helps them focus on English. And what we find with good instruction is that the children who have English as a second language, by the end of kindergarten, they're, they catch up, they're indistinguishable from native speakers of English. Well, that's amazing. And especially, you know, that um, we're, we have this culture where we have so many diverse language backgrounds that if there's something that you can do as a whole class to help these students catch up and become almost like their native speakers when you're looking at their results, I mean, that's amazing. And it's not really very difficult. Um, the program that we've used is a program called Firm Foundations, developed by the teachers of North Vancouver. And it's activities and games that teach the children, first of all, to hear the different sounds in language, uh, in the language, uh, the, the syllables and the individual sounds, and then to learn to associate uh, sounds and letters. Right, so it's teaching that phoneme and grapheme or uh, sound letter correspondence explicitly to the students. That's right. Wonderful. So if I were a kindergarten teacher, when would you say it would be best for me to do that? Well, we do the screening. We, we like to wait till maybe November or December of the kindergarten year to give children a chance to uh, get used to school and especially the children who have English as a second language to be able to catch up a little bit. Uh, and then we start the uh, Firm Foundations program uh, December, January, um, and uh, it just seems to work very well. Wonderful, but there's no reason that I couldn't start working on some of those simple phonological awareness activities earlier in the year with these students. I mean, that's only gonna help them, right? That's right, that's right. Wonderful, and is there anything that you can do to help the parents help the kids at home? What uh, North Vancouver has done is to make little kits with these games and activities that they give to parents and parents can work with the children. And the children who have English as a second language, they can play the games with the parents and help the parents learn English. So it's good for any parent, these very simple activities, even things like just clapping every time you hear the sound in a word or um, matching a picture with the sound of the first letter, uh, the first sound in it. So um, you'd have an M and um, a, a picture of uh, milk, uh, a cat, a dog, whatever, and they have to label the picture, in this case, milk, and match it with the M sound. So that's, 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 those are the kinds of activities that parents can do, that teachers do with the children and parents can do also. Right, and there's so many resources available that you can do these activities with and not necessarily have to buy an expensive packaged program to do this, right? There's some, there's standard phonological awareness activities that are, easy to create and you know there are the word lists if you're looking for helping kids with counting syllables there are word lists available 
for knowing how many syllables are in different words. And, you know, it's easy to come up with words that start with a certain sound, right? So we're not asking the teachers to go out and purchase thousands of dollars worth of materials. Uh, well, Firm Foundations, which is available from the uh, BC Ministry of Education, um, doesn't cost very much and, and teachers have them. But there's one, you can even start earlier. There's uh, an activity that's available uh, free on the internet called Play Roly. Mm -hmm. And it, it uh, teaches, helps teach children to hear the sounds in words by drawing out the sounds. Uh, so parents can go to that. It's really designed for parents uh, activities to play with children. So it's called Play Roly, P-L-A-Y-R-O-L-Y. And you can Google that. And uh, it's good for even starting with three-year-olds. Definitely. Okay, so once kids have gone through kindergarten, how do we continue this to make sure that we're still catching the kids that weren't struggling initially? Okay, that's a very good question. First of all, we have to assess the children there uh, every year on their basic reading skills, uh, their basic math skills, spelling, and writing. We have to do it every year. And if a child is seems to be struggling in any area, then you make sure that they get intervention in that area. Um, now, this assessment be done by teachers. It doesn't need to be uh, a psychologist or a, a speech uh, therapist. It can be um, teachers, school personnel who can do it. And you would assess their word reading skills, their ability to, to uh, read what we call pseudo words, pronounceable combinations of letters that you need phonic skills. Uh, we do math. Uh, calculation, uh, spelling, and some very simple writing tasks. So how would I look at the results of each of these things? Like, would it be important to look at the errors that the students are making, looking at how long it takes them to do these tasks? Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, you these, these are standardized tests and they all have norms. So you would compare them. And if a child is you know, significantly below the norms, then you want to say, okay, there's a problem here. Again, you don't have to label it, but you have to recognize there's a problem. So you also want to look at what the child is successful at and what are they making errors on? And those errors are a very important clue to some difficulties that they might have. Um, an example, if they uh, probably, by the time they're in grade two, if they don't recognize that the E at the end of a word makes the vowel a long vowel, um, then that's a, a rule that you have to make sure that you teach them and it, you can't just do it once, you have to do it several times with many illustrations. That's just one example, but there, there are many like that. Right, and then how would I use my, because teachers get resource time, how would I best make use of the resource time that I do have to help support my kids that are students that are struggling? Uh, well, is the resource time where teachers will work individually with students, or is it where they prepare their material? Oh, I mean with the special education teacher. Uh, oh, so oh, oh, okay. Okay. So th there has to be a close cooperation between the classroom teacher and the special education teacher. And the special education teacher, for example, might do this assessment and recognize the errors and then um, provide an intervention based on um, what he or she sees 
see how the child is performing. Right. So, you know, is this hard to implement? Well, it certainly wasn't in North Vancouver. Uh, and, uh, you know, teachers in North Vancouver are very good, but they're, uh, they're not special teachers. Um, they're not specially selected. They're, um, they're teachers that can easily learn to do this. Right. The teachers and really, really enjoy learning these skills and how to do the assessment. And it, it really makes it, takes it a, away from a professional outside the classroom and brings it into the classroom. It's a very important classroom activity. Right. And it's something that's, you know, great is if your whole school or even your whole district can adopt so that you can be going through this together and have almost like learning hubs or support groups for the kindergarten teachers or the, the K-1 teachers so that they can pool their resources and support each other when they come across difficulties. Well, that's what they've done in North Vancouver. They have um, a kind of a listserv where if you have an activity that you think would work and you put it on the listserv and share it with teachers, with other teachers. Right, and then what's really helpful is in a program like this, you have the information to document the student's progress throughout their years within the school. So you can look back to see what has been done in the past and where they have had the struggle, right? So it gives us that um, paper trail to see the student's progress as opposed to some of these, uh, you know, the summative assessments and with, with the e-portfolio learning systems that a lot of schools are having, it's great to see the, the authentic pieces of work that the student's doing, but it doesn't necessarily show this is how they're reading, this is how their skills are, so this is how we need to progress. And these are basic skills that you need basic reading skills you need, basic um, calculation skills that you need, and even uh, an understanding of spelling errors can help you uh, help, a uh, help you help a child with spelling. Um, one example, suppose uh, you spell, the child spells nature and a-C-H-U-R-E. If you look at that word, it's, you can sound it out and you would get nature, except that that's really not the way that sound is represented in English. It's T-U-R-E. And that's true in picture and, uh, and other words. So it's a matter of teaching the child when you hear that sound, at the end of a word, it's T-U-R-E. So that's called orthography. So learning the orthography of the English language. But the point is using the child's performance to help you guide you in teaching. And again, it doesn't have to be on an individual level because all children would benefit from learning this. So it could be done in a classroom, but there are these children who struggle, they may need, uh, um, some resource time to help uh, develop their skills. And so there may not be enough time in the classroom, so they may need special time. Right, and then so as, as you're using this error analysis, especially in the spelling, if you're noticing in assignments that students are making some of the same similar errors, um, whether it's the doubling rule when adding a suffix or um, any of these, you can use that to inform what you're teaching that week in the classroom to try and reinforce that. And uh, another example, if you look at their writing and they use the wrong there, uh, if, uh, for example, T-H-E-I-R never occurs before a verb. So, 
if you're writing something and you have a verb, you look before it, it can't be T-H E-I-R or T-H-E-Y-R-E. -E. Um, it's got to be um, T-H-E-R-E. -E. So it's learning something about the grammar without um, teaching grammar, but teaching the structure of the language. Yeah, and that, that can be very helpful and you know help them in their future writing. So if these if they learn these patterns and start internalizing them, it'll be easier for them to pick up some more strategies. So you've been talking about your North Vancouver study. Um, and so how do these students fare as they, they progress through school? Like how long did you do this uh, annual screening or this regular screening and use it to help with the instruction? Well, we did it. Um, <clears throat> through grade seven. So we finished at the end of grade seven. And by the end of grade, and we did it each year. And really the teachers did, they couldn't do all of it, but we had the teachers at least doing some of it. Because uh, some of the screening at this, uh, something like reading comprehension can be done as a group. It doesn't have to be done individually. Um, and uh, we find, we found that Gradually, the children caught up. So say at the end of uh, grade one, there are maybe 5% of the kids struggling. But by the end of grade seven, there are 1.5% of the kids who were put, still put in the struggling category. So they really improved each year. Right, and that's great results, especially considering we have a lot of figures showing that um, by that age, anywhere between 20 and 40% of the students aren't reading at grade level and aren't able to comprehend what they're reading. Uh, for in addition, the, the average for the district, uh, for the children who weren't struggling, was around the 85th percentile. So that means they were better than 85% of the, um, <laughs> of the test. So that's a really, it, so it's not just the children who are struggling, it benefits all children. And that's what we want as teachers to make sure that what we're doing is applicable for our, in our entire class so we're not letting those higher achieving students, you know, twiddle their thumbs or get bored with what they're doing. So we're still helping them uh, achieve higher levels and everybody's benefiting. Yes. So if we were wanting to implement this, what do you think would the first step would be? Uh, first, there, there are many avenues that we could pursue, but I would try and convince the Ministry of Education to have some mandatory screening. And what you need to do is to, you want the teachers to do the screening. So we'd have to train the teachers, that's not a big deal, but um, it has to be done. But you also need um, TOC time. Uh, that means a substitute teacher. So the teacher can, can do the screening him or herself. So this would be some initial cost, um, but it's much cheaper than doing the assessments later on or the loss to society of the, in terms of social and emotional problems. It's, this is a way of reducing those costs significantly. So it's a little bit of an initial cost, not very much, but um, you still have to train the teachers and provide the materials and um, make sure that you record the scores, etc. Uh, but it's a small price to pay for the gains that you get. Right. And then if you even think about it, I mean, the cost of a psychoeducational assessment, which is an assessment that's used to identify 
the kids for learning disabilities. And those are thousands of dollars and take up huge amount of times. The wait lists for them are enormous. And currently most schools won't even consider doing them until grade three. And you know that has a bit to do with diagnosing someone with a, a reading disability before while they're still learning how to read, which is understandable. But if we can do this early screening and prevent it from even happening in the first place, we're going to reduce the demand for that. And so we're, we're not labeling them or diagnosing them. We're just saying this child is at risk. Yeah. And this is what we want to do to help the child. And it doesn't matter whether the child is really dyslexic um, because it doesn't do any harm. Right. To do this. It, do, it does harm to weight. It does it's tremendous harm to the child's self-esteem because we think that children don't know what's going on. Uh, but even the five-year-olds know that there are some children who are catching on very quickly and some who are not. Uh, my uh, son, when he was in kindergarten, came home and told me the name of some child who couldn't skip. So they know who's having trouble. They know if they're having trouble. And so it's, it really saves a lot of emotional turmoil to do this. Right, definitely. And it's something that we should mention that the vast majority of the United States have this screening mandated. And in the UK, they have the phonics checks. So currently we're behind these areas to make sure that our youngest children are making this gains that they need to see and are prepared to do what the next 12 years of their education are gonna contain. I mean, if you're not reading in school, you're struggling a lot. And if we can prevent that struggle from happening, it's essential. And it's something that we can do, you know, countrywide, province-wide, and um, anyone can do it with minimal training. These, these screens are easy enough to teach. They are not time consuming. Getting the professional development for learning these different activities and things like uh, phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, there are things that have not traditionally been included in a lot of the teacher education programs in uh, really around the world until recently and still we have a lot of school sister teacher education programs that are not doing it justice so many teachers don't really know what a phoneme is and that the english language has about 44 of them and you know that we can measure it and even when they're teaching phonics sometimes they over accentuate the sound so instead of saying t they say t t says t and the problems that that can bring Yes, many students will be able to distinguish that it's while well, they're just exaggerating, but there are the students that won't. Right. No, this is, um, it's a matter that has to be solved on several levels. First of all, as I talked about, the Ministry of Education. Um, but it also has to happen in the teacher education programs. So teachers should be trained to do this. Again, it's not uh, a big part of the program, but it's essential. There are many things that um, teachers, student teachers have to learn, but this is one of them. It doesn't take that much time, but it does take a little bit of time. And, um, so that's one place. Uh, and if we really wanted to institute this, we could start on a small level with several districts that would be willing to do this. And then rather than trying to do the whole province, because that might be complicated, but work with districts that are willing and cooperative and uh, like a district like North Vancouver 
and uh, see the results. Yeah, and I know it's a passion that both you and I have shared for a while. And I know that at least I would be happy to speak to any district or teacher that wants help in doing this in their classroom, their school or their district. Um, and you'd be welcome to contact me. Um, my information is available. It's uh, Dr. Katherine Garforth at garfortheducation.com. And again, this is all stuff that we're doing for the kids. It's not about labeling them. It's about identifying the risk and providing the support that they need so that they can see, succeed in learning to read the first time. Uh, and the same thing is with math. There's screens that we can do and we can help them learn those foundational numeracy concepts so that they have a better start to learning the mathematics because they need these skills to perform the higher level of mathematics. That's right. So can you give us just a brief overview of how this would work on the math side of the equation? Well, there, what we would need to do is for them to uh, recognize, associate um, a numerical symbol like three with three dots. So can they recognize that? Well, can they, do they recognize the numerals? Uh, can they recognize that three dots is the same as the number three? And um, at this point, uh, the, we don't have um, really good standardized tests. Maybe parts of the Woodcock-Johnson might work. So we need a lot more work in the math category. But we had something to go on. Um, so, you know, can they do this basic calculation? Uh, and do they understand the basics of numbers in kindergarten? And I think that that would help a lot. And knowing that one-to-one -one correspondence so that when you're counting, one number represents one object and you don't count that object several times. And help supporting that development and uh, counting things in a sequential order in a, or in a logical order, instead of seeing a series of things to count and pointing all over the page, like randomly, trying to teach them that, that pattern. That's right, and uh, a program called Jump Math is it's a, a classroom-based program um, rather than a pull-out program. And it's, it's very good for teaching basic number skills. Right, and it's based on the premise of the concrete representational abstract method of teaching. So you're using those hands-on manipulatives at first while the children are learning the concepts. And then you use you know, the drawings and the pictures in their books to help represent the concepts before moving to just the numbers. And you're able to make those steps very simple so that the kids are able to grasp it before moving on to the next level. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Siegel, for joining me today. I know this has been a great conversation. Is there anything else um, that you'd like to say before we sign off? Well, I want to thank everybody who's listening and paying attention. And if you're a teacher, lobby your district to do something about this early screening. Um, if you're a politician, uh, maybe you could consider uh, lobbying again for this kind of universal screening. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're a parent, lobby your politician to do something about this. And the PAC and the DPAC. Yes. Um, because this, this is something that, again, is helpful for all the school students in the school, those from minority populations, those from low SES backgrounds that don't necessarily have the risk for learning disability, but come to school 
with a different skill set than those from an affluent background that have had the same preschool and exposure. And especially for children who have English as a second language, of which we have many yeah. in the province. And uh, if they are given the right intervention, the right teaching, they do very well. Exactly. And this will put less of a demand on the special education system, because if you're catching these students early, preventing the disability or the, the failure um, and reading problems from happening, it means that those students that really, really struggle with it and have the dyslexia or other conditions, dyscalculia, they can get the more one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction that they need. Yes, and this does not take away from any, uh, any child. This only adds to it. Exactly. Uh, great. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for listening. Wonderful. Bye. All right. So everybody, thanks again from Dr. Linda Siegel and Dr. Catherine Garforth. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you like the Garforth Education Facebook page so that you can be informed of other conversations I have coming up. Tomorrow I'm speaking with Dr. Jan Hasbrook about dyslexia and reading fluency. And I hope you have a great night. Bye.